thanks a lot. This is uh, it's super exciting to be here. So I'm going to talk about historical data. Um, and I'll be covering a lot of topics. So mostly I'll be going through readily available data. So these are data sets that you can pretty much plug and play, download, work with, and I'll discuss ways um, you can work with them and issues that you might come across when working with them. I'm also going to try to spend a little bit of time, if possible, on creating your own data sets and try to convince you that the barriers there aren't as high as you might think, especially as a graduate student. And I have uh, one slide on some cool papers that have been written by PhD students using historical data that have to do with international or uh, finance. Um, I'm going to keep these slides fairly updated. So, you know, if in a year or so you want to look into this again, um, you can just look on my website. The link should be active. I'll be adding stuff as I come across it. Okay. So, um, just to begin, I do want to make a plug for doing history um, because what we call the historical period covers so much time and it covers so many important events that I actually think are important to understand not only as a way to you know, test theories we might have about how these systems work, but also as a source of inspiration for developing them. So you know, this era of good data where most IFM papers are from the 1970s to the present, that's a really short period compared to everything else that's come before. And there's plenty of reasons to focus on this latter period. You know, we have low barriers to capital flows and to goods flows. So you have huge amounts of capital and um, goods moving all over the world. But actually, this isn't the first time that's happened. You know, we've had that historically. We've also had a crash in that historically. So I think these big moments in history are really important because, you know, they're so rare in the international economy. And, um, and I think there's a lot to learn from, uh, from studying them. Okay, so now, um, going into the first section of readily available data, I'll start with trade data. So trade data are incredibly uh, well organized and um, pretty easy to access. So there are three sets of data I'll go into. Um, the first are just bilateral country level aggregate trade panels. So this is just bilateral flows between countries, exports and imports. These are very complete actually. And so um, there's almost no excuse for not using them if you have any project where you might need them. There's also a lot of work in progress that digs deeper into the underlying characteristics of these aggregate flows at the industry level. And as you can imagine, given the explosion in the dimensionality of collecting industry levels of flows between countries, um, this is not something that's available around the world, but there's a lot of work across different countries. And, um, and as far as I know, all the researchers who put these data sets together are willing to share them and they're well documented and I'll um, show you those as well. Okay. So when it comes to these country level bilateral panels that are very, um, complete. The ultimate sources are government reports, which have been usually compiled into statistical abstracts. And one thing I want to note is that even though they've been really, um, you know, people have really taken out all the trade statistics here, they often contain lots of unexplored, undigitized data. So if you're looking at a particular region or a particular time period, or you're interested in a particular sector, looking into these original data um, publications will actually probably point you to you know just a wealth of information that you wouldn't have expected to be able to find and often you know it's stuff that you don't really have a modern um you know analogous data set for so that part of it is really cool and um and just to note a lot of these uh these publications have been scanned by Google Books or by um, Hathi Trust. So even accessing them is not that difficult. So, so of these three um, country level bilateral panels, what I've done is I've briefly described the structure of the data. So what they've manipulated, um, what they've added in order to create the data set that you know, they're publishing for researchers. 
the only one that I'll talk about a little bit more in depth is the um, the Ricardo project. So one thing about using their data is that you know their philosophy was to make the data as representative of the underlying sources as possible, which means that they do a minimum amount of you know aggregating across borders or converting currencies or anything like that. They've literally just taken these scans of PDFs and made them into CSV files that you can then work with, which means that there's a lot of flexibility for whatever it is that you might be um, using them for. It also requires a little bit more work. When it comes to actually using these data, I would really strongly advise not relying on any single source, but rather putting in the effort of combining them together. And this is because even though these sources ultimately rely on some overlaps in the um, underlying source material, there's going to be differences in how they either um, put together the data or the choices they made in coverage. And so if it matters for you to have the best coverage available, then it's really worth putting in this extra step. And in particular, you know, Europe and North America are always going to be very well covered. But if you care about the rest of the world, and especially if your research question is going to be looking more at the fringes of the economy, then this coverage is really going to vary across these data sets. So when you put these together, um, there are a lot of decisions that you have to make. And I've highlighted three of them just because I think these are the ones that are most obvious. So the first one is just what you choose as your um, unit of observation. The fact that country borders entities are changing all the time mean that you're going to have very different implications in the data if you're looking at the extensive margin of trade, for instance, if you're not adjusting for these um, for these changes. There are also going to be conflicts in the data. So this echoes a bit what Jesse was saying about can you rebuild some aggregate statistics from the underlying data? Well, it's um, often going to be difficult. And one particular thing that comes up is that you'll see that you know, the documented exports from a country A going to country B are, might look different from what country B documents as imports coming from country A. Um, and the rule of thumb is usually to use the imports data just because you know, imports were taxed and they tend to be uh, considered more reliable. But it's just um, um, you know, something to point out that these sources aren't, gonna, aren't always going to agree even before you standardize the borders. And finally, um, one last thing is that you'll almost certainly need to construct these bilateral resistance measures that are really important when you run any gravity equation. Because while some of these data sets have constructed them, once you create a fuller panel, you're going to have to fill in the gaps. So uh, being careful about that and you know, not losing 20% of your data just because you haven't done this work is also uh, something worth noting. I did spend a lot of time trying to do this in a reasonable way uh, for my job market paper. So I have this uh, panel from 1850 to 1914 using standardized pre-World War I borders. And this is a data set that I'll be posting soon. So if this happens to meet your needs, then it'll be something that you can see and the documentation for that will be um, available as well. Okay, going a little bit more disaggregate, if we're going to look at the industry composition of trade, I think it opens up so many questions, especially in international trade that are super interesting, like the, the shifting nature of comparative advantage, what countries do with import competition, how they grew to be major exporting powers. You really need to look, be able to see what they're exporting in order to think about those things. And so um, as far as I know, there's no big project to do this all over the world, but there have been these amazing projects for different countries. And in particular, actually the Bank of Italy is the one that's done the most, I think on this front, they put together this long panel, almost a hundred years from you know, pretty much the unification of Italy until post-World War II, you have imports and exports at a four digit level. It's super clean, super well documented. As far as I know, nobody has actually used these data outside of the Bank of Italy, but they're there on their website. Um, and you know, I would encourage you to look at it if you're, you, there's something um, that you could, there's a project there uh, for you. 
there are a lot of other countries that have been studied as and their data have been put together as well. The UK for many reasons um, as a, the source of the industrial revolution, the US, Belgium, Germany, Japan. You'll notice that these are more advanced economies. Um, I think that is just the nature of historical data that it tends to be the case that they have better statistics. But um, I've spent a little bit of time looking into this. You can find these types of data for Latin American countries, for the Caribbean and Asia as well. It will take a little bit more digging, but they actually do exist and just people haven't put in the effort to, um, to put them together yet. Okay, so one last slide on trade data. There are a few other measures that are just useful if you're ever working with trade data. So there are aggregate country level measures in the uh, Federico, Tino, Federico Tina database that are just very easy to use to pull there. It's a long panel. It's not bilateral, but it'll give you measures like the product composition of exports, which may be something that um, is useful. One other data set that I think is just super cool and um, I've used and Rika Juhas used in her job market paper is a Lloyd's List. So this was a newspaper, a daily newspaper. And the amazing thing is that, you know, it gives you the ship by ship flows of shipping traffic around the world over this uh, really long period. So in terms of a panel, it has very long coverage and it covers the entire world. Back when I was using it, you had to go to the British Library and actually take scans of this stuff. But at this point, all the scans have actually been fully digitized and they're online. So you can go and follow these links and look at the raw sources and send them off to be digitized if that's something that you want to work with. Okay, so that's it for trade data. The next set of data that are very easily accessible are capital flows. So within capital flows, um, first, the um, what we have are good data on securities prices. So security volumes are a little bit more difficult, but within some of these data sets, you'll be able to reconstruct the volume of flows. Um, so these, you know, these price data are coming from major international financial centers. So cities like London, Paris, New York, Amsterdam, they're going to have a very strong domestic bias in terms of the securities that they're covering, but they will also include the international securities that would, might be particularly interesting to you guys, like sovereign um, bonds and international corporate and equities, which actually did exist at this time. So all of these databases were put together by Yale. They're super well documented. Um, they put a lot of resources into chasing down these sources and digitizing them and cleaning them and making them available. So they're very much worth looking into. Um, there are a lot of people who have used the London data and the London data for this source spans 1869 to 1930, but actually it's possible to backtrack the prices even before that. Um, so there's another source that will give you the prices before then. The only difficulty there is it hasn't been fully digitized yet, so it takes a little bit more work. The Paris data is actually also incredibly um, impressive. So this was a big project run out of the Paris School of Economics. It's called the DFIH database, where they're really making it their goal to digitize everything about the Paris Bourse. And the very cool thing about this is, you know, there was much more information than just the daily or the weekly securities prices, they had spot, um, they had forward prices, they had options, they had repo prices. There's a lot of really interesting historical um, markets that you can actually observe with these data. This is very much a work in progress, but I think it's also an opportunity because they have so much data that they're trying to create and make available that you can definitely get in touch with them and ask for some sort of partnership where, you know, in return for cleaning some of the data, they give you earlier access to it. And I think that's something that they're very amenable to and is, as long as you explain well what you're doing, um, would be a nice opportunity. Um, 
The others are, uh, as I described, the Amsterdam data are work in progress, but um, if you follow the link, you know, you can see exactly what they're planning to do. And it's very similar in terms of trying to have this long panel with very broad coverage. Uh, in addition, there are non-digitized sources, and this might be something to look into if you need higher frequencies or you need slightly different time periods than what's being covered in these, um, these databases already. And in particular, um, you know, the scans for the ultimate sources for these, like newspaper publications and stuff, are most likely going to be already available through library databases, through Gale, for instance. So it's possibly worth looking into those if that's something you really need. Although I think, um, you know, first seeing what's available here will get you a lot, a lot of the way, especially if you're looking more for a long panel. Okay. The other uh, main form of capital flows historically is sovereign debt. And I think this forthcoming paper by uh, Josephine Meyer, Carmen Reinhart, and Christoph Trebisch will have the best sovereign debt database historically that has been put together. So they're covering 200 years. They're going to cover all the foreign currency, uh, foreign currency bonds traded in both London and New York. And the really cool thing that they've done is they have all the monthly prices for this period, but they also have linked the bonds over time. So they're really able to follow the bonds through periods of default. And that's just um, a, a lot of work. So the fact that you know this is gonna be available is gonna make studying sovereign debt during this period a lot easier. I'm also um, working on a project with Sasha and Darte in this period where we're studying sovereign debt markets. And what we're doing is focusing on a lot of the textual data that's available about these markets. So we're taking a very big data approach of just you know, taking all the text from major newspapers and applying textual analysis to pull out patterns in issuance and default characteristics and severity. And I'll talk a little bit more about text data at the end, but that's something you also get a lot of tomorrow as well. Um, one final data set that um, I've been putting together, which I think is super exciting, is capital flows coming from international banks. So these are short-term bank flows. And one reason I think this is really interesting is because when we think about capital flows during this historical period, we mostly don't think there was much bank debt. We think that there wasn't much you know, equity flows, but, and that mostly it came you know, international capital flows came in the form of sovereign debt. And while it is true that sovereign debt was very important, it's actually the case that if you look into the um, historical record, international banking was prevalent all over the world and it was a huge, um, it was a huge business. And so with these data, um, what we were able to do is for instance, show you this map where it's giving you for any particular country around the world, the dependence or the share of their domestic banking that's coming from foreign banks. So it's just giving you a sense of how much of the banking sector in these different countries depended on international flows as opposed to their own domestic banking capital. And so, you know, I think this is an example of one thing that history or like looking into historical sources can do, which is that it can un fail a lot of the actual facts in the same way that, you know, the work that Brent, Jesse, and Mateo have done is like to unearth like what the actual facts are. Yeah. Okay. Um, the third type of data that's very useful when you're working with uh, this historical period is to know when major events happen. These are crises, whether they're financial sovereign, um, you know, currency crises, major disasters, other major events. And so this slide is just giving you a list of the resources that you can consult when you're, if you need these dates. One thing to note is that especially with financial crises, there's somewhat of a um, debate about how to construct these measures, like how to, what to call a financial crisis, how do you measure it? Should we rely on quantitative um, measures or narrative measures? What counts? Um, and so there 
actually are a number of different databases out there. The nice thing is they're very clear as far as I've seen in the documentation of exactly what counts and why. And so, you know, this is one of these things where for the most part, I think people just will choose one of these and explain why they chose them. But should you need something a little bit more detailed, you can actually follow through and see which ones um, make the most sense for, for you. Um, one final data set here is the Correlates of War project, which is a bit more of a uh, political science, political economy, but um, has really nice bilateral measures for things like formal alliances, territorial changes, um, intergovernment organizations. It's a very long panel as well. And so when you're building up, for instance, um, a bilateral tray panel for a gravity regression, this is a source where you can turn to, to find a lot of the measures that um, might be useful for you. Uh, Namrata? Kenzie, does this data set contain um, tariffs that were imposed between countries historically? That's a great question. So tariff data is a little bit hard to construct because they include both ad volarum, so you know percentage tariffs, as well as um, tariffs that are like by the barrel, etc. Um, so different people have put together tariff data for different countries at different times, but a very good data set that's a panel for the world, I don't think people have done that. And that's just because the nature of the tariffs are really, um, are just kind of complex during this period. But um, there are some sources, and I can follow up with you later, that are really great for telling you exactly what the tariffs are at any given, for any given country. So, you know, trade is super important. So people want to know if I'm going to be a you know, if I want to trade with this country and I want and I am an exporter in these goods, what are the tariffs I'm going to face? So this information is public, very easily accessible. It's just um, the extent to which it's been coded up really varies a lot. That's a great question, though. OK, and um, a final slide on the data that's available across countries is um, just the macro data that you'll probably need to use. So these are just long run time series of GDP, of interest rates, how, what was the you know, central bank doing? Um, one thing I wanna say is that central bank websites actually are an amazing resource. So they often have teams of researchers who, whose jobs are to put together indices or to study particular historical periods. So the Bank of England, Italy, France, Fred in the US have all these historical indices. And if, um, if there's something in these countries that you're interested in, definitely visit the central bank website because you'll probably be surprised by how much they have actually done there. Okay, so this, you know, these are again, mostly resources for whatever controls, other indicators you might need to use for your research. Okay. So, Shifting gears a little bit to how you would create your own data set. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I'm happy to take questions on it or discuss it later. The um, main two types of data, as you can imagine, are quantitative data, textual data. The sources for these are archives and libraries or digital repositories. The digital repositories are getting so much better. It's, you know, it's pretty mind boggling the amount that different archives have been willing to digitize and put online or would be willing to digitize if you know you signal that there's a real appetite for having this data and um, these public resources like uh, google books or hathi trust have a huge volume of just uh of just data that people for the most part haven't really used so you know newspapers government reports declassified files declassified files, et cetera. So when it comes to using these ultimate sources, in my experience, archive catalogs are really good. So this is an example of how you would go through, for instance, the National Archives catalog in the United Kingdom, where they're telling you, um, they're documenting exactly what you'll find in any given ledger or in any given folder. So you know, in terms of searching, it's not 
that difficult and you don't even need to go there to use this interface and figure out what's what they have. Chinzi, about, about five minutes left. Okay, thanks Brent. Um, some of the data that you'll see are things like this where you have ledgers that are handwritten, but you'll also have scans that are, you know, prints that um, in any case, you know, we have tables that you need to, um, that you need to transform into you know, CSVs that you can actually use. And so my own experience has been that when it comes to tables and numbers, manual digitization is probably still the safest, fastest, and cheapest way to go. And of course, you want to outsource this. This is not something you want to do by hand yourself. There are lots of firms. You know, it's a pretty straightforward process at this point. You take some data, you create a sample, you ask them to mimic the sample, you correct it, and you, know, you make sure that they understand the instructions. It's obviously going to entail a lot of quality control and checks, but if you have money to throw at the problem, you can always get it double entered for particular trick, particularly tricky types of data. And this is just, um, you know, these are, I think, very straightforward ways that within a few months, you'll have a data set that used to just be pictures and now is something that you can work with. OCR is improving tremendously. Um, but table structure is something it really struggles with. So, you know, you can look into Python, uh, PyTesseract and layout parser as two options for OCRing yourself. Um, but when it comes to numbers, I think that it is still ultimately more efficient to go with manual digitization at this point in time. This might change within a year. This stuff is moving super fast. But at this point in time, um, I would still recommend outsourcing. When it comes to text data, um, you know, manage, manual digitization is just not feasible. And one upside of text data is that textual errors are actually observable. If you read a word that's gibberish, you know it's not a word. Whereas if you see a number that's you know, actually gibberish, you're not gonna know that this number is gibberish. So one thing that I've spent a bit of time on recently is putting together sort of the sequence of tools that are off the shelf that you could use to apply to OCR to process it to actually make it feasible to use for text analysis. So, you know, the problem is that OCR text of historical sources is going to have a lot of noise because original scans have a lot of you know, artifacts on them or the font is a little bit strange, it's blurry, all of these issues. But in order to actually use this text in any meaningful way, you need at least like an 80% accuracy. So one thing that is um, kind of nice about the types of OCR errors that you get is that most of the issues are with segmentation, which is you know, words being split or words being concatenated and with misspelling. And so, um, I put together a series of steps that you can follow using open source um, tools to basically apply to your text file. And, um, and I have an appendix section to these slides that are on my website that you can look at in more detail to see exactly how each of these algorithms are working and some examples of um, some text corrections that will significantly improve whatever output you have. So, you know, if you're interested in working with OC, like text data and you want to look at a historical period, don't be turned away by the fact that you read it and there's just so much noise. There's a lot that you can do to improve that. And it's actually also not super costly. Okay, so I think I have maybe negative one minute, but um, the last slide is some papers from the last few years that were written by people when they were PhD students. These are historical papers that use some historical setting and they have an international component or they have a finance component and they're really nice. So if you haven't seen them yet, I would encourage you to look at them and also um, to think of this as, uh, you know, something that's not out of um, out of the realm of possibility for you as well.